Okay, so getting into our first class of antibiotics, the main thing we're going to hit first is going to be the ones that are affecting the cell wall. So this is a good table to kind of go back to. And again, you can see how you can kind of put these into different categories, right? So, okay, agents that affect the cell wall. Okay, getting into, okay, beta-lactam antibiotics. Okay, penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapenems. This is how I kind of want you to organize these thoughts in your mind. Um, because, again, if you know something about penicillins, then you know something about amoxicillin, about oxicillin, nafcillin. You know a lot of things about all these different drugs if you can link them back to being a penicillin. And if I can link that back to being a beta-lactam antibiotic, you know a lot about that already in terms of mechanism, uh, in terms of how you dose it, in terms of all these things here, okay? So these are things I kind of want you to focus on when you're trying to lump these into categories, okay? So when we talk about our beta-lactams, essentially what that means here is this little square ring. This is the beta-lactam ring, okay? And this is why it works to uh, inhibit the growth and disrupt the, the cell wall of these bacteria as we're going to see here. And so this is the core you're going to find is shared between these, the cephalosporins, the uh, carbapenems, anything that says it's a beta-lactam antibiotic shares this structure here, okay? We'll talk about allergies a little bit later and cross-reactivity and things like that, but just remember this is kind of the business end of the molecule, so to speak. And so we're going to start off by talking about the penicillins uh, specifically. Basically, how this works is that uh, when you're forming that bacterial cell wall, there's a lot of cross-linkages that occur between the different uh, layers of that cell wall. And they, that cross-linkage occurs between two D-alanines. And if you look at two D-alanines here, you're going to find that it shares a very similar structure to this beta-lactam ring. Kind of use your imagination a little bit. But to the uh, there's an enzyme or protein that the bacteria produces called the penicillin-binding protein. Now, does anyone know why we call it the penicillin binding protein? Because it's the first thing we found that that protein binds to is was penicillin, right? Because what was the first antibiotic we had? Penicillin, right? Before we were having to use crazy stuff like gold and silver and all kinds of metals to kill uh, the bacteria, but guess what? It also killed our patients too, right? Now we're starting to get into drugs that are very specific for trying to interact with these bacteria and not try to affect all of our cells as well. But basically, this cross-linking enzyme called the penicillin binding protein. Uh, will bind to that beta-lactam ring and will basically inactivate it. When it forms that bond there, the enzyme is ineffective, and thus it can't form those crosslinks in the cell wall anymore. So what happens when that occurs is it's going to bind to that, it's going to inactivate this penicillin binding protein. These little crosslinks here cannot be formed any further, and thus you disrupt that cell wall. So basically you form these big holes in the cell wall, and guess what happens to the bacteria at that point? Everything just comes pouring out, and the bacteria dies. So if you had to think of these bactericidal or bacteriostatic, you'd say bactericidal, right? So again, all the, the cell wall active drugs we're going to find here are going to be bactericidal. All the, the beta-lactam antibiotics are bactericidal based off this mechanism here. And basically anything that has that beta-lactam ring, whether it's carbapenem, cephalosporin, anything, guess what? It all has the same mechanism. So if you know it's a beta-lactam antibiotic, you already know the mechanism of the drug. So that's already like a couple dozen drugs you already know the mechanism for, right? Great job. You already learned so much in just a couple of slides, right? Anywho, so this is the, the big uh, mechanism here that's going to be applying to all of these. Because, um, again, all of these beta-lactam antibiotics all share the same beta-lactam ring. So I like to, for my antibiotic lectures, I like to use the stoplight method in terms of trying to uh, you know, have you guys categorize where these drugs are working in terms of their coverage. Like, do they work in gram-positives, gram-negatives, anaerobes? Those are the three main categories we're going to talk about. And we'll talk about kind of unique little coverages here and there. Um, but obviously, if it's green, green means... Good to go, right? It'll kill those bugs. Yellow means slow down, but it'll mean some of them, right? So again, it may not have great coverage, but it'll have some coverage. And then red means don't use the antibiotic for those, right? So starting off with natural penicillins, so this is just regular old penicillin we have here, so penicillin G. Um, basically, this has some decent gram-positive coverage here, but you're going to notice here that it does not cover staph, right? So if you have a staph infection, penicillin is never really going to be a good option for that. And in terms of coverage, penicillin G is very, very narrow in, in terms of coverage. It still has some um, good uses for the drug. We still use it to this day, but it's very kind of a niche sort of drug there. We typically don't start a lot of patients out on just plain old penicillin here. Um, notice it has a little bit of anaerobic activity, but not good for like gut stuff like bacteroides. Um, however, things are still good for it. If you have things like syphilis, for whatever reason, syphilis has never really developed any resistance towards penicillin, so you can still receive that. Uh, gas gangrene, meningococcus, it still has some decent activity there, though. Uh, however, note that there's no gram-negative activity for this. So if you had a UTI, would penicillin ever be a good option? No, 
Probably not, right? Because again, most of the time UTIs are caused by gram-negative bugs, so this wouldn't really have any coverage there. Now, again, I'm gonna note the dosing here. I'm not gonna ask you specifically how do you dose penicillin, but to know the reason how we dose these things, the frequency, I want you to know the concept behind that. So for instance, with this one, you have 18 to 24 million units divided every four hours. That's pretty frequent dosing. Why do you think we have to do that frequent of a dosing? To stay above the MIC, right? So that means is it time dependent or concentration dependent? Time dependent antibiotic, right? So sometimes we'll actually give this a continuous infusion for specific cases like endocarditis um, by certain susceptible bugs. We'll actually give this via continuous infusion. But again, that can be very logistically difficult. If you tell a nurse, I want you to give this drug every four hours, they're going to say, yeah, fat chance, unless you're in the ICU or something, right? So again, um, very difficult from a logistical standpoint. Um, in terms of monitoring, really the biggest things are going to be monitoring for anaphylaxis with this drug here. Um, when I say monitoring for anaphylaxis, what are you looking for? Breathing. Yeah, the complaint of trouble breathing, rash, hive, swelling, all the kind of blood pressure dropping, you know, all those things you're going to be looking for. And again, not super common, but common enough to where you at least want to make note of that. And again, obviously if a patient has a penicillin allergy, anything that falls in this penicillin category is not going to be good for them, right? Because there is that cross-reactivity that can happen there. Now, there's a couple of forms of the natural penicillin. So, for instance, penicillin VK, if you ever see that, it stands for penicillin V potassium. This is actually an orally bioavailable form. Normally, penicillin G by itself cannot be given via any route except for IV because the stomach acid will actually end up destroying it. So, now we have penicillin VK that is actually stable in the stomach. So, that's one thing we've changed about it to make it bioavailable, right? Um, we have one called penicillin G, this benzyl penicillin. This is the form we normally are going to give IV, so that's kind of the common one, the one I mentioned, give every four hours. And then this is an interesting one here called penicillin G benzathine, or bicillin, usually bicillin LA. You know what LA stands for? So it's Los Angeles. Long acting, right? So you see LA, it stands for long acting. So this actually comes in this uh, nice pre-filled syringe. You see the bicillin LA on there. And what do you notice about the color of this? White kind of looks like milk almost. This is actually kind of a, in a more lipophilic sort of base. Um, you do not want to give this IV because that fat is not going to go into, it will not solubilize into the blood. And guess what can happen? Just like big air bubbles in the blood can cause emboli, just like big clots can cause an emboli, this can also cause an emboli as well. So this is actually an IM medication. You'll inject uh, intramuscularly, and that will offer long acting sort of leaching out of the drug into the systemic circulation there. So this is actually really good because in some cases, they have a kid with like strep pharyngitis coming in uh, and he's unable to take oral medications. I can just give him one dose of this IM. It may be traumatizing for him to get that shot, but once he gets that shot, then I'm basically good. I don't have to give him any further antibiotics because it's a nice long acting form there. But this one's given IM only. So it's kind of one unique sort of dosage form you'll see there for penicillin. So you have the natural penicillins. They're good, and we had that was the first thing we came up with, right? That was the first thing we had for a good long time. Um, then moving into, we developed some some further penicillin types, and so these are called the amino penicillins. And there's two in this category. One's called ampicillin, and then we have amoxicillin. Ampicillin is very frequently given either IV or PO. I'm probably not going to get super specific and try to trick you on a test and ask you, is this one available IV or PO? But again, I'm trying to get you at least sort of familiar with starting to see these things so you kind of know the general routes on how these drugs are given, okay? Um, but amoxicillin, I'm sure some of you may have taken amoxicillin at some point in your life, is a really good go-to oral antibiotic, right? And again, by changing it into this amino penicillin group here, you're going to find you change the coverage a little bit. So for now, we have, um, say, a little bit better anaerobic activity here. You're going to find that it's still not great for gram negatives and still not going to cover staph. We'll talk about which one specifically covers staph in just a little bit here. But um, things this is good for, you know, things like enterococcus. Um, we can use this for upper respiratory tract infections. We do this a ton for, like, sinusitis and otitis medias and things like that. And also for community-acquired pneumonias, okay? These are really good because it's going to get a lot of those typical respiratory sort of bugs here. So amoxicillin is, like, a really good workhorse sort of antibiotic from, like, a, uh, especially in the PEDS ED, the urgent care sort of setting here. You're going to see a lot of amoxicillin being used for those patients there, Okay. Ampicillin, still used mostly from the IV standpoint, so let's see it used for a lot of like community-acquired pneumonias where the patient may need to require a little bit more monitoring and they're coming in-house, as we're going to see that being used pretty frequently. So in terms of interactions here, things you want to be careful of, um, you can find that a lot of the penicillins, and this is not just uh, specific to amino penicillins, is you may see some prolongation of the prothrombin time. Um, this is specifically for patients who are on the blood thinner warfarin. I believe we've mentioned warfarin before, right? Do you remember how it works? I mentioned that. 
We'll talk about it much later in the hematology section, but basically it's a vitamin K antagonist. The liver requires vitamin K to produce a lot of clotting factors, and so if you interrupt that, you don't make any more clotting factors, and thus you can't really clot as well, right? That's how it thins the blood. Um, anyone know where we get a lot of vitamin K in our diet? Green leafy vegetables like spinach and kale and things like that. Um, but also the bacteria in our gut also have a decent amount of vitamin K we get from that. So if I give a amino penicillin or I give anything that disrupts that gut flora, this is what happens to vitamin K absorption. It's going to go down, right? So again, that's why you can see some bleeding interactions with these, something you want to at least be somewhat aware of. And also there's this idea, and I don't know if anyone's ever heard this before, but you know, if you get a prescription for an antibiotic, they say make sure you use backup protection if you're sexually active. Has anyone ever heard that before? Some, some people may have heard before. So um, this is a thing where uh, basically if a patient is on oral contraceptives, and normally oral contraceptives are uh, made up of what? Anyone know? Well, hormones? Estrogen and your progesterone. Well, estrogen is really kind of interesting in the fact that it is uh, metabolized in the liver, and then it gets spent out through the biliary tract, through the bile, okay? So it gets kind of conjugated there in the liver and gets spit out into the, the GI tract. And so what's interesting about it, though, is that the gut bacteria can actually metabolize that bond there, and then it can actually be reabsorbed. That's what we call enterohepatic recirculation, where basically it's sent out through the liver, absorbed back into the GI tract, and then sent out back through the liver, and so it undergoes a cycling. And what do you think it does to the half-life of the drug? Extends it out, right? So it makes it act longer than what you would think normally just based off of the, the normal metabolism and half-life of the drug. So... That's important because we want to keep estrogen levels high when you're taking oral contraceptives because that suppresses what? Ovulation. And again, if this is all sounding like Greek to you, we'll get to the ob section at some point, and this will make much more sense there. But I'm trying to just illustrate the point now. Um, so if you drop the levels of estrogen, what are you at risk for? Ovulating and thus pregnancy. So that's really the big risk. So that's why they would say, hey, you know, if you disrupt that gut floor, there's a risk that maybe those estrogen levels drop, and then you may have a risk for, for pregnancy, right? So it's one of those things where, do you think there's ever been a clinical trial where I have like a bunch of women who are on oral contraceptives, and I give half of them antibiotics, and the other half not antibiotics, and I see who gets pregnant? You can't do that kind of study, right? But there is... And so there's no study that says you actually have to do that, but is it something that is a theoretical concern? And again, what are the risks of telling someone to use extra backup protection? Very high, very low? Probably not very high, right? Say, hey, make sure you use a condom while you're taking antibiotics. Probably not a big deal. You're probably not feeling that great anyway. You actually want to have sex regardless. But it's one of those things where they say, okay, the risk is pretty low. Maybe use some backup protection while you're on the antibiotics. And then when you come off of it, then you're, then you're okay. Um, so, again, it's one of those things where you may hear that. That's the reason behind that is because of the drug interaction with the gut flora not being able to recycle that estrogen as effectively. Okay? So, again, sometimes the stuff we say in medicine, uh, there is a uh, reason behind it. Sometimes there's not. This is that reason, though, for this particular case. That makes sense? Everyone with me? Okay. Um, anyway, so other things you can find. Um, with the penicillins, you're going to find that you can cause some liver dysfunction here. So maybe something you want to monitor for, especially if you have patients who have like pre-existing liver disease, something to be concerned about. And then obviously, uh, Clostridium difficile infection is a possibility really for any antibiotic. Um, we'll talk about one in particular that is more prone to do this, um, but this is something you always want to be aware of. So if a patient has diarrhea associated with an antibiotic, should they stop it immediately? Not necessarily, right? Regular old diarrhea, not a big deal, right? But if it's that you know, really uh, profuse, watery diarrhea, and again, has anyone smelled C. diff before? Yeah. You'll know it when you smell it, right? So you can typically you can, you can smell a patient before you see them with C. diff. Um, and so, again, if they get a really foul-smelling, profuse diarrhea, that's something to be concerned about, okay? So, again, some of these things are things where it's like if you see it, definitely stop therapy and come in. That's one of the things where if it gets really, really uh, significant, that's where they'd want to consider coming back in. Now, has anyone heard of Stevens-Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis? What is that? It's your skin just kind of falling off you. And typically, this is a drug-induced sort of phenomenon here. So um, these are not the most common ones to cause this, but there's certainly a risk for certain patients. Um, and so this is where you warn them, hey, listen, if you start to see blisters, especially in the oral mucosa, if you start to see, notice any, like, you know, skin starting to kind of fall off, like, that should be a warning sign, right? You'd think it'd be pretty self-evident, but sometimes people are just like, I don't know, this just must be life now, just skin falling off, like... The reason why we care about this is because if it is left untreated, it is quite fatal, right? The risk for infection, risk for dehydration, all kinds of things. If they come in and they get aggressive supportive care and they discontinue the medication, the probability is much better for them to, to survive that. But it's one of those things where you say, hey, this is low risk, but in case you see this, stop taking the drug, come into the ER, right? Those are things you want to at least warn the patient about. Not the, to scare them, but just to make them aware of what could happen, right?
Other things to think about are going to be, um, you can see some issues where the drug can actually crystallize out in, in the renal tubules. So again, tell them to stay extra hydrated. They're probably going to be a little dehydrated anyway. If they have an infection, just have them drink extra water. Um, and there could be some some issues of anemia, but pretty, pretty low risk for the, for the most part. Okay. Um, obviously, as far as contraindications go, if they have any previous history of an allergy to penicillin, this is going to cross-react with that. So you don't want to go ahead and, and administer that in those patients there. But of course, anytime someone says, I have a penicillin allergy, what do you want to ask them? What happened, right? They said, oh, I, you know, I had to be intubated and I got epi. That's pretty legit sort of uh, anaphylactic reaction, right? They said, oh, I got diarrhea. Probably not so much, right? So, again, take all things into context. Um, and I'll tell you that you have a lot of patients who will say, oh, I got a penicillin allergy. And ask them what happened. They say, I don't know. My mom just told me I'm allergic to it. That's a really tough thing because if you say I'm allergic to penicillins, guess what? This wipes out the entire group of penicillins. That's a lot of drugs you cannot use in that patient anymore, right? So what can you do about that? You do like skin testing, right? You can send them to an allergist to, to check that out. You can give them maybe a test dose in the ER if you think it's a very low risk um, that they're going to have a reaction, right? If you're going to have anaphylaxis, where would you rather be? It'd be in the ER, right? And they got everything there already to treat you. Um, so, again, these are some things you have to consider here, right? So, again, how likely is it they really truly have an interaction uh, a reaction there? Um, and, and, and what can you do about it, right? Anyway, um, so, again, other things to note here is while the penicillins in general require renal elimination. So these are things you have to really watch the renal function for. If you have a relatively healthy individual that is coming in for regular oral infection, probably not a big deal to worry about the renal function. because It's probably normal. Um, but if you have like a really sick patient in the ICU that could be changing day to day, you got to monitor for that. Older patients definitely monitor for it because you may need to, instead of giving the drug every say eight hours or every six hours, you may have to extend it out, maybe give it every 12 hours or every 24 hours. Okay. So really look up those, those renal dose adjustments as needed. Okay. Yeah, you know, other things just watch out for, um, you know, in terms of monitoring the renal hepatic function are the biggest things there. Okay. So how do bacteria become resistant to the penicillins? Well, if the beta-lactam ring is the thing that actually makes the drug work in the first place, well, what if it produced an enzyme that destroyed that beta-lactam ring? And so this is where the enzyme beta-lactamase comes into play. Okay, so beta-lactamase is an enzyme the bacteria will produce to destroy this beta-lactam ring, and then the antibiotic, guess what? Can't do anything anymore. It does not work any further. Okay, so some drugs are naturally beta-lactamase resistant, and sometimes we have to give them a little bit of extra help, though. And so this is where the beta-lactamase inhibitors come into play. These are chemicals that have no direct antibiotic activity themselves. However, they will keep that beta-lactamase busy long enough for the penicillin to come in and actually do its thing, right? To actually kill off those bacteria there. There are three beta-lactamase inhibitors that we have, and that includes sulbactam. Tazobactam and then clavulonic acid. I don't know why they couldn't just all keep the same naming convention for ease of memorization, but that is what it is, right? So, sulbactam, tazobactam, and clavulonic acid. Now, would you ever use these drugs by themselves? No, right? Because they don't have any direct antibiotic activity. So, they're always found in combination with a penicillin. So, for instance, here you have sulbactam is usually mixed with ampicillin, right? We said ampicillin is one of those amino penicillins, and then you now have unison. So, now it's a brand new drug, okay? Tazobactam is typically mixed with this drug, piperacillin, which we haven't mentioned yet, which in a few seconds here. And then clavulonic acid is probably the one you're most familiar with. It gets mixed with amoxicillin, and now you have augmentin. Most people probably heard of augmentin before, right? So what does that do for our coverage here? Well, it actually does pretty good things in terms of anaerobic coverage now. It doesn't, it's still not great for gram-negative stuff, but typically it's going to have really good gram-positive coverage and really good anaerobic coverage here. So as I mentioned, augmentin is a typical oral amino penicillin the lactamase inhibitor combination you run into. Unison is a very common IV one you're going to see here. Now, again, these could be used interchangeably. So if you had a patient who's coming in, maybe they can't tolerate oral, you can use unison. you get the same kind of coverage as you would for augmentin, essentially. Okay. The differences would be maybe the dosing, the bioavailability is a little different, but for the most part, they will have the same antibiotic coverage here. Okay. Similarly, if you had a report come back, say a culture was run, and it said it was resistant to ampicillin, could you assume that it was resistant to amoxicillin as well? Generally, yes. Okay, so again, sometimes you'll see, because when you get a culture back, it won't say every single drug possible that they tested, but it'll give you some certain ones. And if it says ampicillin is resistant, you can assume amoxicillin is going to be resistant as well, okay, because it's kind of a family-wide sort of resistance there, okay? Anywho, so the nice thing here is it increases the anaerobic coverage, including bacteroides. It now covers MSSA, which is now a, a pretty significant bump up in coverage, because before... Our natural and amino penicillins did not cover MSSA. Now it does. And so for the most part, it tends to be good 
as a drug of choice for things like diabetic foot infections. Why do you think that would be the case? Diabetic foot, you got a shoe on with a nice uh, occluding sock on there. What kind of environment do you think that is? Moist. Moist. There's a lot of air there. Not really, right? So it's anaerobic, right? So sometimes you see anaerobic infections that can develop there. This will cover that, right? So diabetic foot infection is good for that. Um, animal and human bites, right? So animals and humans tend to have a lot of anaerobic bugs like that peptococcus and peptostreptococcus. This will cover for that. Not only just the natural skin floor. Say if an animal bit you and broke skin, you'd have your normal skin floor getting into that wound, but also what's in the animal's mouth, right? And so in those cases there, using something like an augmentin or a unison has pretty good coverage for that, okay? So that's why it's the drug of choice for those cases there. Um, we had, sometimes we get, oh, yes, ma'am. Well, remember, the, the bacteria is producing the beta-lactamase to, dis, to disrupt that beta-lactam ring. So it can't once that's disrupted, it can't bind to that penicillin binding protein anymore. So this is the way for the bacteria to become resistant because it wants to cleave that ring so that way it doesn't disrupt the cell wall. Okay. Yes, yeah, so this is a defense mechanism made by the bacteria. So by having another drug that comes in and inhibits that, okay. now our drug can now work again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So. Why does it cover MFS? So... Due to resistance, and again, it's not always just related to the beta lactamase production. Sometimes it's due to other um, changes, and say, for instance, maybe they modify the penicillin binding protein. There's lots of reasons why a drug can become, uh, or a bacteria can become resistant to a drug. Um, in this case here, it doesn't have enough broad coverage to get MRSA, as it turns out. So, in fact, there's really no penicillin that's going to cover MRSA, as we'll see here in just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Anywho, um, actually, and sometimes here in Florida, you get all kinds of weird questions about bites. Anyone know what kind of weird animal bites you might have here? Snakes, right? Anything you have to cover for snakes in the antibiotics? Frequently, you don't. As long as you have good wound care management, you really don't have to do a whole lot with that. But like things like you know, dog bites, cat bites, we typically will, will treat. Uh, human bites, yeah, because our mouths are very, very dirty, as it turns out. Uh, what other kind of weird animals do you see? If you got to like a lake... Alligator, yeah, we actually had an alligator bite that came. I mean, there's that one kid that died on Disney property not too long ago, a couple years ago. Um, but we had an alligator bite that actually came into the PDR. I think they were probably on a Disney property or something, and uh, um, we had to figure out what stuff to cover because not only then you have to worry about um, skin flora, anaerobe stuff, but also like waterborne bacteria, right? So I think we cover with like levofloxacin or something, which we'll talk about later. Um, but again, always be aware of the weird stuff that comes through and know kind of your resources. Like, where would you find that information? to treat an alligator bite, right? Well, there's things called like the Sanford Guy is a really good one. You guys, are, there's probably some over available in the library. Um, Sanford Guy is a really good resource to go to. It'll basically tell you, um, based off the indication, what type of um, antibiotics you should use for that indication, whether it's pneumonia, whether it's uh, osteomyelitis, and they have a whole extensive bite selection there. I think they have, even have like mongoose and raccoons and things like that. So it'll tell you what kind of antibiotics to use for, for those cases there, right? You never know when a mongoose might strike, right? <laughs> Anywho. So, um, so again, amino penicillins with the beta-lactamase inhibitor, that's where you get that big bump up in coverage, and we get better anaerobic coverage, and MSSA is now covered as well. Okay. So next we have the anti-staphylococcal penicillins. So again, these got their main activity basically by just being able to treat MSSA, right? Now, methicillin was included in this group here for a while, we actually don't clinically use methicillin anymore, so the fact that we still call things MRSA or MSSA is kind of a, uh, a relic of time, so to speak. But these are basically resistant to an enzyme that the bacteria produces called penicillinase. Penicillinase obviously does what? Breaks down penicillins. Yeah, exactly. So it's right there in the name. So by being penicillinase resistant, they're able to overcome um, the resistance of things like Staph aureus now, okay? And these are very narrow in coverage, as you're going to see. They actually have no good activity against anaerobes or gram negatives. Really, MSSA is the, the sole thing they're designed for. So typically, this is not used for broad coverage or empiric coverage. This is something you would de-escalate to. So if we had a patient being admitted, um, we did the cultures, and then we were giving them broad-spectrum antibiotics, culture comes back and says MSSA, this would be something we could scale down to and just give them something very, very narrow in coverage because it doesn't provide a lot of selective pressure against other normal kind of growing bugs on the patient there, okay? Not other non-pathogenic bugs there. So again, very, very near in coverage, MSSA is a big thing, but as soon as MRSA enters the fold, it's not gonna work anymore, okay? Again, still time-dependent killers, still bactericidal, again, same things as with all the other penicillins here. Same monitoring, 
look for a renal function, look for a hepatic function, all these things, just, you know, uh, they're very much the same. It's just the coverage has now changed a little bit, okay? Now, if you're getting a culture and you've got to give antibiotics to a patient, when should you do each one of those tests? Which one should you do first? Why do you do the culture first? Right, because antibiotics can interfere with that culture and can maybe lead things to not grow. So, for instance, you know, and again, are you the ones doing the cultures? No. Are you the ones giving the antibiotics? No, it's your nursing staff, right? So you got to make sure you ask them the questions about, hey, make sure you get, or let them know, hey, make sure you get the culture first and then give the antibiotics. A lot of nurses may know that, but you got a lot of junior nurses that are out there, and they'll just look at their order list and say, whatever comes up at the top, that's the first thing they're going to do, right? So they may go and give the antibiotics first, and then that could really screw up your culture, and then nothing comes back grown on. You don't know, is there really no bacteria there, or is it the fact that the antibiotics interrupted that, right? So just a little, little caveat to remember there. Okay, now we have our anti-pseudomonal penicillins. There's actually only one in this group here. Piperacillin, uh, I really have never ever seen it used by itself, uh, but it mainly is going to be in combination with tazobactam. And we said tazobactam is what kind of drug? It's a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So now we are getting extremely broad coverage here. What do you notice about the, the stoplights? It's green all the way. This is a very broad spectrum sort of antibiotic, right? So again, if I mentioned penicillin, it's kind of like a slingshot. This is like a machine gun, right? This thing is very, very good at killing a lot of different bacteria. This is actually the first antibiotic we've covered that covers pseudomonas. It's kind of right there in the name, it's pseudomonal. So there's a couple of different buzz bugs that I'll make mention of. If it covers pseudomonas, if it covers MRSA, you should probably know that, right? Because I could ask that question on a test potentially. There's a lot of questions I can ask on a test, but those ones may be important to know, right? So anyway, so again, very broad spectrum. We'll cover a lot of gram positives. It will cover MSSA, but again, no MRSA. We really haven't covered any drugs yet that cover MRSA. Okay, it's just something to note there. But it has a lot of added gram negative coverage here, including pseudomonas, okay? So again, if I had a patient coming in from the nursing home who was worried about coming, getting a healthcare-associated infection, because again, a nursing home is still a healthcare environment, right? Or if they're a chronic dialysis patient or whatever the case may be, and they're coming in, and I wasn't sure what they were infected with, you, sometimes you have to keep under differential pseudomonas, right? And that's where we're going to go with that really broad coverage and maybe starting off with something like Zosin and then scaling back based on how the patient's improving, based on how the culture's looking, all that sort of thing. So this is really good if you have a polymicrobial infection. This is really good if you have a nosocomial infection, like something like a pneumonia. Intra-abdominal is really in, uh, good coverage here. And again, what did I say grows in the, in the, in the gut? Gram negatives and anaerobes, right? Gram negatives and anaerobes. So this is really good. So if I have a patient who comes in and they have a perforated appendicitis, they're getting put on Zosin, right? Nine times out of 10. Because it has a really broad coverage and it's only one drug needed to cover all that stuff that may be spilling out of that appendix into the abdominal cavity, right? And again, I don't want infection to happen there. It could be really difficult to, to manage that. And pseudomonal, obviously, pseudomonas is obviously going to be one of the, the big things that this covers. Okay. Um, now, again, very broad coverage. This is something we'd like to scale back off of if possible because, again, if you lose this, you're kind of in trouble, right? There's, there's a limited number of drugs that can really fit this role here that, that uh, Zosin has. Okay. So there's something to keep in mind. Okay, so again, looking at this, you can see how the dosing is going to be given, you know, every six hours potentially. Sometimes we'll actually do continuous infusions over a shorter course. So we'll say do four hour long infusions every eight hours, and that actually gets better time above the MIC. So in some patients, that has actually helped to, to reduce mortality, which has been a really kind of fascinating find in the past, you know, say 10 years or so. Um, Got to look for renal function. Monitoring is always going to be the same here um, as the other penicillins, but that's really the biggest thing is just make sure you're, you're monitoring that renal function. If you're using Zosin in a patient, they may be more likely to be those really sick ones where renal function could be more unstable. So that's one thing you just want to watch for. Okay, so those are the penicillins you're going to run into. Now we can move into our cephalosporins. Okay, the cephalosporins are going to be broken down into generations. Okay, there's a couple of different classes of drugs we're going to run into that do that, but this is one, the first one we're going to run into. Now notice here, the same beta-lactam ring. So how do these drugs work? They bind to the penicillin binding protein, right? Some people get a little confused because they think penicillin binding protein only binds to penicillins. No, it binds anything with that beta-lactam ring, okay? So all the beta-lactam antibiotics are still going to bind to penicillin binding protein. They still prevent the cell wall from forming those crosslinks, and thus they disrupt the cell wall, leading to bacterial cell death. Okay? Same mechanism, right? So nothing different there. The only thing that changes, though, is going to be this actual structure, right? So these side structures here and these R chains on the side. So structurally, they're different than the penicillins, and you'll see that the coverage is also going to be a little different on what kind of bacteria they actually cover there, okay?
So nice things about the cephalosporins. They have really good cerebral spinal fluid penetration. So what is that good for? Meningitis, right? So if you think of a patient with meningitis, they're probably going to get put on a cephalosporin because of that really good penetration there. Now, when people say they have a penicillin allergy, they oftentimes think that they have a cross sensitivity with cephalosporins. And when I say cross sensitivity, what does that mean? You, yeah, so if you're allergic to one, you'd be allergic to the others as well, right? So for a long time, the thought was, okay, well, there's a cross-sensitivity there, and, and so if you're allergic to penicillin, you have to be allergic to cephalosporins. That is not true, right? Um, but there are some caveats to note with that. The reason why we thought that was true for a really long time is because there's a lot of cross-contamination in the actual products. Does anyone know where, where penicillin comes from? It's a mold that it comes from, right? So we used to use those molds to produce the drugs themselves. And you'd actually have uh, cross-contamination where the molds would be producing some penicillin and then also some cephalosporins and vice versa. And so even though you're getting a thing of penicillin, there could be cephalosporins in there and, and, and vice versa. And so you did see cross-sensitivity. But now that we have more synthetic ways of making these drugs, we have better ways to do it, um, there's not that cross-contamination. It's very pure substances we're, we're administering now. What we find now is that if a patient has a really true type 1 allergy to penicillins, there's less than a 1% chance they're going to have a cross-reactivity to a cephalosporin. Now, people thought, well, okay, well, they're having a reaction to the beta-lactam ring. That's not it. It's the side chains is what they're having a reaction to, right? Beta-lactam ring is pretty small. Not really easy to have a good reaction to that. But the side chains is what the reaction is happening to. So because of that, it's very safe to administer a cephalosporin to a patient with a, with a penicillin allergy, especially the higher up in generation you go, you the second, third, fourth generation, very safe. And I've had this argument with, with providers before where I'll be in the ER and the patient is a good candidate for a cephalosporin, but they have a penicillin allergy on their on their, on their their med list. Uh, and I say, well, why don't we just do a test dose here? They're very hesitant because they're worried about anaphylaxis, right? What's the first thing in your Hippocratic Oath? Do no harm, right? So you think, oh, I might do harm, might as well not do it. Well, that's not true because if we can show that patient does not have a reaction to cephalosporins, guess what? Now from then on, that patient can receive those drugs safely, right? That's great. And oftentimes, if I have a patient with those with an allergy list, I'll look in their previous history to see what they've gotten before, and they've received a cephalosporin, then I know they're good to go, okay? I know they're not going to have any problems with it at that point, okay? There's a really good, yeah, so there's a, and again, it's hard to do a study like that where I take 100 people with a penicillin allergy and I give half of them cephalosporins and half not and see who has an anaphylactic reaction, right? Um, however, with the retrospective reviews that they've done, that's where they got that less than 1% number there. And I can actually send you guys out the, the review article for that. But it's uh, pretty convincing when you actually read through it and see, like, yeah, it's just more of a historical thing that just got carried forward. And there's really no good reason to do that necessarily. Especially when you go, what's your penicillin allergy? And they say diarrhea? Whatever. I'm going to give you a cephalosporin, no problem, right? But again, once you document that and you give it, and again, it's nice to do a test dose in the ER because if they're going to have a reaction, you got everything to treat them right there, right? So again, you give them a dose, see how they respond, wait 30 minutes, an hour, or whatever, and then send them on their way, okay? Um, okay, so other things to look at. Um, again, very similar side effects to the penicillins, not a lot of change here. Um, the biggest thing to note, though, is going to be the spectrum of activities a little different with the cephalosporins than your penicillins. Um, namely, there's going to be a few more of these that are actually going to cover pseudomonas, and we'll cover these specifically when we get to those sections. And for the most part, most of these are going to be renally eliminated, so you still have to watch renal function. There's one notable exception I'll mention here that's not going to follow that, but we'll get to that in just a few moments. Generally, as you move up in generation for the cephalosporins, you're going to find that you lose gram-positive coverage right up until you hit about the fourth one, fourth generation, and then gram-negative coverage gets better as you go up in generations. Okay, That's a general, general caveat for the cephalosporin coverage here. Um, again, there will be a few notable exceptions, but again, generally know the rule, and we'll talk about the exceptions as they come up. So the first generation cephalosporins, these are, again, good workhorse antibiotics, just like amoxicillin. You're going to see a ton of prescriptions for amoxicillin. You're going to see a lot of prescriptions for uh, the first generation antibiotics. And who's interested in going into surgery, potentially? You're going to see a lot of first generation cephalosporins if you go into surgery because uh, whenever you're cutting into somebody, guess what you got to do? got to cover them with antibiotics beforehand because you don't want to cause a surgical site infection, right? And even though you do really good work to make sure you sterile, sterilize the site and, and you make sure there's no bugs growing there, there's still risk, right? And so, again, that's why we give preoperative antibiotics to make sure that we don't get those surgical site infections afterwards. Um, so this is where cefazolin comes into play. Some people say cefazolin. Probably doesn't really matter too much if I say cefazolin. Most people just say NSAF, right? NSAF's a lot easier. Um, so this is going to be a very uh, common one used for surgical prophylaxis, probably nine times out of ten. This is one you're going to be going with, probably 95 times out of 100 more likely, because it covers MSSA and covers that general stuff that grows on the skin, right? 
And again, we're not assuming most people have MRSA crawling all over them, but MSSA is much more likely, okay? Um, so this is usually given before surgery. Uh, Keflax or cephalaxin is another very common one seen given orally. This is used very frequently for outpatient use there. See a lot for things like cellulitis, you know, UTIs, things like that, very common. Um, and again, good gram positive coverage like MSSA. However, as a general rule, the, the cephalosporins do not cover enterococcus. So usually you're not really going to see the cephalosporins being used for gut infections because it won't cover that enterococcus for the most part. However, it does have some pretty decent gram-negative coverage here, like E. coli, Proteus Klebsiella. And however, um, what do you notice about the anaerobic coverage? Not, yeah, so it really doesn't cover in, in much in terms of, of anaerobes, as we'll see. Moving on up, next we have the second-generation cephalosporins. Here you're going to see things like cefatitan, cefoxetin, cefiroxine, and ceprazil are kind of the more common ones you're going to run into. This is probably the least used uh, group of cephalosporins I've run into clinically. I don't see too, too frequent use of these. Um, however, um, sometimes you can see that uh, you know they have a little bit better gram-negative coverage here, so you may see them used for more things like H. influenza, maybe uh, Neisseria, Proteus, you know, things like that. Um, again, most often used for UTIs upper respiratory tract infections, occasionally surgical prophylaxis, but again, usually the first generation is going to be used much more commonly for that. Okay. Now, third generation, this is another set of workhorse sort of drugs here. These are going to be used for more um, resistant bacterial infections, or if you're just not really sure and you need a little bit broader coverage, this is going to be really good for that. And so this is where ceftriaxone comes into play, right? So who's heard of rocephin before? Yeah, most people have any kind of uh, interaction with that. You know, medical environment, probably heard of rocephin before. Um, the nice thing with this one is it does not require any renal dose adjustment. This is actually metabolized totally in the, in the liver, and so you don't have to worry about adjusting for that, which is great. Also, does anyone know how often you have to dose ceftriaxone? Hmm? Once a day, right? So I remember ceftriaxone 1, you only have to do it once a day for the most part, which is a nice thing as well. Now, again, this is still, is it a concentration or time-dependent killer? still time dependent, just like all the other beta lactams we've seen here, right? All the beta lactams are time dependent, but because ceftriaxone has a nice long half-life, you only have to give it one time a day. So again, it's one of those exceptions to the rule, but nice from a compliance standpoint, you know, if I had a patient who could not take oral medications and I need to use ceftriaxone, I can actually give them an IM dose one time for three days uh, in a row, or one time a day, three days in a row, and that's actually just similar coverage as I treat them for, say, five to 10 days with something else, okay? So there's some nice benefits to that. Um, ceftazidine, this one's kind of interesting in that it has some pseudomonal coverage. Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, why is it green for gram positive, but it's also brash for cephalate? Yeah, so it's still going to get that MSSA coverage, which is kind of what you're looking for there. Um, you know, in terms of holes, it's going to cover, again, intercoccus is not going to be covered with this, so it's still not really good for like gut infections. Um, but in terms of other notable loss of coverage, it's probably not going to be as good as something like a, a first generation. Um, but in general, you're going to find that. You know, if you're really worried about gram-positive infections when giving something like this, you're probably going to be giving another drug in addition to it. And I'll show you some examples of that in just a little bit. Yeah, good, good question, though. Um, anyway, but ceftazidine does have some coverage against pseudomonas. So, again, it's another kind of buzzword of, like, okay, pseudomonas, this covers that. However, it gets resistant really quick, and so clinically we don't use it too, too often for that particular purpose. So just one thing to note with that. And then cefotaxin, we actually use all the time uh, for neonatal fever and sepsis. So if you had like a, a little one who's coming in, say, within the first month of life or so, and we think they have um, potentially uh, meningitis or something like that, we'll actually give them cefotaxin. Um, one thing that's notable about this is that ceftriaxin cannot be given in the first month of life. The reason for that is, is it actually competes for the same binding sites on albumin that uh, bilirubin does. So as you can actually induce in these neonates during that first 28 days or so of life is jaundice, right? Because you displace that bilirubin, and so they can get uh, very, very jaundice from that hyperbilirubinemia. So basically, during that first month, once that body's clearing out a lot of that bilirubin, past that point, then you can start to use ceftriaxone. That's one notable little uh, age-related sort of coverage there. Instead of using ceftriaxone, that's why we like to use cefotaxime. You don't have that same interaction there. No risk for inducing jaundice in that, in that young population. Okay. Um, there's a couple of oral options here as well, so things like ceftonir is, is a nice common one. Tefixime is a little less commonly, but ceftonir is also nice because it has a long half-life. Similar to ceftriaxone, you can just use one-time daily dosing, so that's kind of the, the benefit with that. But as I mentioned, better gram-negative coverage in the second generations. Um, it has some extra coverage against things like serratia and marxala, so very good from that standpoint. Um, you know, if you have a patient who's coming in for like a pneumonia or, um, uh, you know, upper, lower respiratory tract infections are really severe, oftentimes ceftriaxone is going to be one of the common ones they're going to get put on for the most part. And again, this is IV only for, from that standpoint.
And again, um, one time a day is after reaction one. That's how I kind of remember that in terms of the dosing there. Sometimes I'll give it more frequently, especially if I have like a meningitis or something where I really want to make sure I'm getting good penetration. That's where I'm going to make sure I'm giving it more frequently to make sure I get those high levels there um, in the CNS. Okay, and then you get your fourth generation. This is going to have kind of the broadest coverage uh, that we've kind of talked about so far for the cephalosporins. Um, notice here it has good anti-pseudomonal activity, and cefepime is really the big one out of this category we're going to talk about here. Um, very broad coverage. This is good for patients who have something like uh, neutropenic fever. You know what neutropenic fever means? Or febrile neutropenia. So if you have a patient who is neutropenic, so they're on, yes, yeah, so they have a low white cell count. So again, they're on chemotherapy. For cancer, like leukemias, if they have, um, say, HIV, AIDS is more progressive, right? If they are low in neutrophil counts for whatever reason and they develop fever, that could be the only sign they develop for infection, right? So this is something you have to, to monitor for. Um, so if you have a patient who you know is neutropenic and they develop fever, you got to treat that, right, as, as an, an infection until proven otherwise. And so this is why we go really broad coverage here and use something with anti-pseudomonal activity. So cefepime is really good from that standpoint. Um, notice here. Uh, you get better gram-positive coverage in your third generations, but it still does not cover MRSA or enterococcus. So still not great for gut infections. You know, something like a piperacillin would be a lot better for that. Um, still no good anaerobic coverage, but really good for the gram-negative stuff. And some, you know, other than MRSA, pretty good for gram-positives as well. And we use this pretty frequently for nosocomial infections. Um, pseudomonal infections, really good uh, drug to use for that. <clears throat> And in fact, a lot of people I see, a lot of providers tend to um, pull the trigger and go with Zosin, especially for a lot of like respiratory stuff. And Zosin's great and all. It'll cover a lot of that same stuff that uh, Cefepime does. But if you don't need the anaerobic coverage, I just say go Cefepime. You don't really need that extra coverage there if you don't uh, need it. But if you have like a significant like gut infection, you know, perforated appendicitis or something, Zosin's much better for that because it will get those anaerobes and all the same gram negatives and whatnot. Okay. Now, here's a couple of newer ones that we have, uh, you know, in the past uh, couple of years or so. And again, these are things that we like to hold on to, right? So you kind of guys are familiar with um, uh, Golem from Lord of the Rings, My Precious. This is why, like, pharmacy, like, doesn't like to let these drugs go unless there's, like, a really good indication for it. Because why do, why do we hold on to them so tightly? Yeah, because we don't. Because we, one, they're expensive, and also they're, we don't want them to get resistant uh, right off the bat, right? So even though you may have like a, a lovely dinner at Ruth Chris or something, the drug rep is like, you got to use this antibody. This is the best thing since sliced bread. Your pharmacy is gonna be like, uh-uh, you're not getting that under any circumstances, right? Unless you have ID approval and a letter from the president and all kinds of stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> So anyway, so this is kind of interesting, though, this expanded coverage. So this first fifth generation we have is called ceftaroline. Um, it's good gram-negative, good gram-positive coverage. Still, it's a cephalosporin, so no enterococcus coverage. But it does get MRSA, and it does get pseudomonal activity. So this is really the first drug we've seen now that covers both MRSA and, and pseudomonas. It's very rare that you find that combination there. Uh, but again, that is kind of a unique niche there. Uh, however, no anaerobic covers it, right? So what it's uh, approved for is for community-acquired pneumonias. This is probably way overkill for community-acquired pneumonia, I'll be honest. And then skin soft tissue infections uh, can, be, can be used for as well. Now, again, when I say FDA-approved indication, does that mean you can only use it for those two things? No, it's off-label use. You can certainly use it for other things, but that's what it got approved for originally. And then here's actually another interesting one where it's a fifth generation called ceftolazane mixed with tazobactam. We said tazobactam is what? It's a beta-lactamase inhibitor, right? So this is the first cephalosporin used in combination with the beta-lactamase inhibitor. And you notice here, again, you get a little bit better anaerobic coverage because now we added on that beta-lactamase inhibitor. Um, so it does not cover MRSA, but it gets pseudomonas and it gets anaerobic uh, uh, activity, including that bacteroides. So you can kind of think about this kind of similar to how Zosin would be working in terms of its coverage, okay? Okay, so uh, that's it for the cephalosporins. Those five generations there. Moving on, now we have the monobactams. There's actually only one drug in this category called Um Again, you can still see the, the beta-lactam ring housed there. Now, this is uh, was used for a long time based off of a um, uh, kind of unique sort of use for it. Um, it only covers gram-negative bugs, though. No gram-positives, no anaerobic coverage. It does cover pseudomonas, so again, make note of that. Um, but they're very, very, very narrow in, in coverage here. The the benefit for it is that people said there's zero cross-reactivity in terms of allergy between penicillins 
or Cephalus for that matter, and in the mono backhand. So again, that was kind of its marketing push for a long time, saying like, listen, there's no cross reactivity. If you have a patient with a penicillin allergy, you can use this, no problem. Um, however, it's so narrow in coverage that it doesn't get used too, too frequently. It'd be good if a patient is maybe a bug's resistant towards something else, and this is still susceptible, you may use it occasionally there. That's tree name is the only one in this category. Again, same monitoring you would see in, in uh, as the penicillins and the cephalosporins, nothing different from that standpoint. Okay. Okay, and then next we have the, the carbapenems. There's four drugs in this category of imipenem, meropenem, ertapenem, and doripenem. Now, again, notice the naming conventions here can be very helpful to you when you're trying to memorize which drugs go into which category. So, again, obviously it has a penem on it, then you know it's a carbapenem, right? If it has a cillin in it, it's probably penicillin. If it starts with a ceph, probably cephalosporin, okay? You're going to find that's useful to an extent. There's some drug classes where that's not going to be very good. So, once you get to the mycins, everything goes out the window, right? So like gentamicin, um, vancomycin are extremely different than one another. Um, once you get to the mycins, again, that naming convention does not hold up. So, again, I'll try to point out those things where I can. Uh, sometimes it can be very useful to look for naming conventions. Other times it's just going to confuse you further, okay? Some of these things you just got to kind of learn. Okay, so I put the nuclear bomb on here because these things are extremely broad coverage. This is what you use if stuff gets resistant to cefepime or to piperacillin and tazobactam. This is the thing you use as a backup to that because it is very broad coverage. The reason why we, we use this is because um, in some cases, bacteria will start to produce what they call an extended spectrum beta-lactamase, ESBL. That means that it even cleaves things even if you do have a beta-lactamase inhibitor around. So stuff like Tocin is not going to be all that effective because the tazobactam doesn't really work for it anymore. So this is what you use as a backup with the carbapenems. However, you can't have things like Klebsiella that produces what they call Klebsiella producing carbapenemases, and that will actually just neutralize this class of drugs altogether. So again, there's still some ways that the bacteria can become resistant to this, but this is still a very good broad coverage class of drugs that we use. Um, and this is another one we like to make sure we have ID approval for before we, we will release this from the pharmacy. But you notice the green all the way down, very good broad coverage. No MRSA. It's one thing to know with that, but it does cover pseudomonas, um, except for ertapenem. Ertapenem is kind of the oddball. That one doesn't get used too too often clinically, but something to note. And it will get a lot of good anaerobic coverage. So, again, you could use this for the gut, no problem. And again, when I say MDR, what does that mean? You know, multi-drug resistant. So, if you get a report back and it says it's growing out, you know, E. coli or pseudomonas, and it's resistant all the way down except for, like, meropenem, like, this is the class of drugs you're going to go with, okay? Um, and, again, this also has good meningitis coverage, so it will penetrate the CNS no problem as well. Now, one thing I will note here is that for the most part, you know, they're still bactericidal. They're still going to be time-dependent killers here. So you notice the frequent dosing administration you see with that. Um, the one thing I will note for monitoring that is unique is with imipenem. Imipenem, if you have poor renal function and you don't adjust the dose, you can see seizures that uh, can develop. Okay? So it's kind of a unique thing with imipenem um, is that you will see that if you don't adjust the dose appropriately. Okay? Okay, so that is it for the beta-lactam drugs, right? So we have the four big classes, the penicillins, the cephalosporins, the what else? The monobactams, and the carbapenems, okay? Four big classes. Again, what's the mechanism for all four of them? So the bare minimum, say they would disrupt the cell wall, right? So they disrupt the cell wall. Going further, you can say, okay, well, I know they disrupt the cross-linkings because they bind to penicillin-binding protein, Okay. And again, no things like, okay, well, how do they get resistant to those thing, uh, those bacteria or to those drugs? Okay, well, they produce beta-lactamase, right? So how do, they, how do we deal with that beta-lactamase inhibitors, right? So these are kind of the facts I want you to know about them. Um, most of the time, they're going to require renal dose adjustment, right? Is there any big exceptions I mentioned there? Ceftriaxone is a really good one, right? Ceftriaxone does, does not require renal dose adjustment. That's why providers like it so much, because the less you have to think about a drug when you're prescribing it, the easier it is, the better off you are. So you can just say, okay, I'm just going to use that, right? People normally like to go the path of least resistance. That's why they like to use that drug quite a bit. It's also just a really good drug, but it's an additional benefit. It does not require renal dose adjustment, okay? Um, I got about five minutes left. Do you have any questions so far before I get into anything else? No, vancomycin is kind of a big topic. And I don't want to leave you like with a, a bit of a cliffhanger, leave you on the edge of your seat, so to speak. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to see if there's any questions on the board, though. Not a question so far, nothing. Okay, so if I were to ask on a test question, I said, okay, you know, a patient has um, enterococcus, cultivated enterococcus, which one of the following antibiotics 
would not cover that. And again, I'm not going to ask a negative question on the test. I'm just trying to think of things off the top of my head. Which class of antibiotics would you not want to use for enterococcus? Just cephalosporins in general, right? So don't use cephalosporins for that. So if you had, you know, say coming in with a um, you know, abdominal infection, scrolling out enterococcus is not going to be good for that, right? Um, which of the following penicillins would cover MSSA? I'll have like penicillin G. Will I cover it? No, right? Amoxicillin? No. And then I could have, say, dicloxicillin. That would cover it. It's an antistaphylococcal group, right? So remember, it's oxacillin, dicloxacillin, and nafcillin were the three that fell into that category there, right? So these are some of the, the details that you would want to know about these drugs when you get into uh, testing purposes, right? Let's see, what else would I ask? Um, you know, which of the following would be a complication of antibiotic therapy? You know, I guess by like hypertension. Is that one? No, I didn't really talk about that. Um, Stephen Johnson syndrome? Yeah, potential risk, especially with your uh, you know, penicillins. You can certainly see that. Um, what else could I ask? A lot of questions I could ask. Do you have a question in the back? Is your hand kind of going up a little bit? No? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, so piperacillin by itself. Honestly, like, I've never actually seen that used clinically ever. It really is just piperacillin, tazobactam. Um, uh, so I would just mainly focus on that one. Zosin is a very common one you're going to see out there. But theoretically, it's still available by itself, but I just have never seen it used. But again, you know, very good coverage, very broad coverage, really good for intra-abdominal infections, where it gets most utility there. And also, like, you know, uh, nosocomial infections like, you know, ventilator-associated pneumonias and things like that. But we'll talk more about that in the pulmonology section later on. Okay. So what do you guys think so far? A lot of information. But again, try to internalize the stuff, put it into your buckets. Sometimes graph it out, do the mind mapping, you know, your flashcards, your sketchy farm, whatever works for you. But try to keep these details straight because, again, when you get your answer choices, I'm not going to just put beta lact. I'm not going to put, you know, penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapen. I'm not going to put those classes on there. I'm going to put specific drugs, right? So you got to be able to link those back to the classes that they fall into, okay? All right. If you have any questions, though, reach out to me because, again, five minutes of my time can save you two hours. It's a pretty good proposition, right? Okay. Now I'll see you guys next week.